I'm a software developer with the IBM Software Labs based out of Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia. Um, and along with me are my colleagues. I'll introduce them briefly. Uh, first of all, we are very happy to speak to all of you and we are looking forward to have an interactive session with you guys. And we hope it'll be very productive for all of us. Um, I would start first uh, briefly by, I'll just share my screen. To just uh, give some background about the focus that our company has on innovation, uh, IBM tops the patent list for the 20th consecutive year. So this can give you an idea about uh, the kind of focus that is there in the company with regards to patents and technologies, especially those which make a significant difference in the lives of people. And uh, it is one of the few companies where employees are actively encouraged to submit patent ideas and get that registered with the patent office. And basically any employee in the company can do that and they get all the support, basically the lawyers and the patent work that goes behind. Um, the idea is that you come up with an innovative thought, be it technology, hardware, or processes and you document that and get it registered. And in terms of contribution from IBM uh, to the technology world, uh, you can go to the icons for the past 100 years. You can look at icons of progress past 100 years IBM, and you can see the various uh, innovations that the company has done. Um, some significant work has been done to start with, if you look at the Apollo moon, mich moon missions in the early uh, 1930s onwards, they've been working. And finally, in the 1969, when the actual mission happened, significant work was done uh, by the IBM uh, company itself to automate the whole moon landing. And uh, You'd also heard about uh, the deep blue machine, which defeated Kerry Kasparov in a game of chess. And most recently IBM um, in the game of Jeopardy where the reigning champion was also defeated. So these are some examples of how technology plays a role uh, in, in improving the life of people and how artificial intelligence can be used again to make a significant difference. So with that said, I'll just quickly move on to introduce my colleagues who are joined here. We'll first have a session from Narayana, who's, uh, who's working on the GSK, it's a product which deals with SSL and sec secure encryptions and uh, Narayana will be able to step through some of the underlying nuts and bolts of that. This will be followed by a session by Holly. She's going to focus on the five key aspects of cybersecurity. And uh, she's a product owner for QRadar, which is a product developed in our IBM security labs. And uh, she would get into some of uh, the aspects also to cover about uh, what carriers exist in this space. This will be followed by the network flow monitoring by Dale. And he's going to show about how we can develop some insights and incident forensics once any threat event happens and how do we go about debugging using the Curator product. That'll be followed by uh, Jasmine Smith. She would uh, get into the FIDO to standard, which basically with the goal of eliminating passwords, we all know pretty much how passwords can be a pain to manage and how FIDO2 uh, will help us get uh, rid of that and what it has to offer. And finally, I'll be presenting a session on adaptive access and how 
artificial intelligence and machine learning can aid in enabling a smooth access to users who are trying to access resources and how we can detect fraud and some uh, technological concepts around that. So with that, I will pass it over to Narayana for the GSKit presentation. Thank you. Sorry, I have some cough and bad throat. So bear with my difficulties. And yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Narayana, like Sunil already mentioned. And today, uh, before we go into the actual topic of cybersecurity activity kit, we might want to look at one of the global challenges that we have and what IBM is doing in that space. So there is something called call for code. Uh, can you all see my screen? Okay. <coughs> so you guys are all students, right? So I I'm thinking this might be really useful for you if you can participate in this global challenge. Every year IBM can, uh, in collaboration with other organizations conducts a call for code global challenge where developers and engineers from all over the world try to participate and try uh, to use technology for solving a global challenge. So this year, the focus is on uh, the three goals from the 17 goals that United Nations normally has. Uh, one is around clean water and sanita sanitation. The other is on zero hunger and the other is on responsible production and green consumption. So this is a good opportunity for you to get engaged form teams and come up with some innovative solution and use technology and cloud APIs to solve these problems. And you might even win some prizes. Good luck with that. And let me get back to the actual content that I plan to share. So today's topic is uh, cyber security activity kit. So in order to give you the context, what is cyber security? It's mainly twofold, right? One, one is about protecting yourself from someone stealing your information. So it could be in a company or it could be against breaches or the other way is to protect yourself from someone like an imposter who's pretending to act as you online. So these are the main goals of cybersecurity. So you'd like to protect yourself, your digital self. And this talk is very relevant if you all have a smartphone and I believe most of you have. And I, I also believe that most of you shop online and have social media accounts and you also stream movies or TV shows and you download apps like gaming apps or utility apps. <clears throat> so let's talk about cybersecurity. In this presentation, I'll be mainly focusing on uh, protecting yourself and taking control of your data. So how can you manage your data well? And also I'll touch base on careers in cybersecurity. So when it comes to protecting yourself, so how do I protect myself? So I'll ask you a question. So let's make this interactive. And what do you think your points of risk are? So this is a little exercise I want you all to think about. What are my points of risk? I'll give you an example and you could try and answer the rest. So the ground rules are simple. You, you don't have to. Uh, I, ideally, this should be a design thinking kind of a workshop where you can interact with the collaboration board. But in the interest of time, uh, I would want you to just give some answers. Like for example, one is a smartphone. Can you think of other points of risk?
Are you guys with me? Yeah. Narayan, I think your screen is down. Uh... So I'm asking you, like, what could be the points of risk in terms of cybersecurity? One is a smartphone. We all have smartphones. So what are the rest of them? We have, we have a comment saying it's uh, any IoT devices. Can you remove me from being a host? Uh, okay, smartphone, IoT devices, what else? There's another comment, any server system? Okay. Oh, that was server, sorry. In the chat. I suppose, um, well, Surveillance. maybe yeah. like, like traffic lights and technology that we interact with. Okay. So that, what else? Keyboard connected to a display device. Okay. I think we have uh, enough. And let's get back to our PowerPoint. Are you able to see my PowerPoint as well? You were just seeing the screen. Yeah. So the PowerPoint, right? So just the box we can see. Oh, okay. Now, can you see it? Yes. Uh, I think most of us said smartphones and devices and traffic lights. It could be any of those devices that we contact on a daily basis. So now that we have identified many key cybersecurity areas, which are potentially risky and could have uh, issues with, so primarily, how do we protect our devices? So I have an iPhone and you guys might have an a different kind of phone, but how do we protect our laptops and devices? So primarily we might be protecting them using passwords and it's it's always good to have a pin biometric identifiers are even better if the biometric stays with the device. And in order to protect your devices, uh, always check the current operating system and the apps. So with software, it's very common that it's possible that bugs can be there in your software. It's really hard to have a zero bug software. And it's very normal that patches happen on Tuesdays or some days based on the company. And, and they will have some security fixes. So it's always advised that you update your operating system as well as all the applications are at the latest version. And try to uh, consider having some security software like an anti-virus uh, or any protective softwares that are reliable. And whenever it's not required, switch off your Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So that's how we protect our devices. And there is a diff difference between public and private Wi-Fi, right? So whenever we go to a coffee shop or uh, whenever we are traveling uh, to an airport, what happens is we find all these public Wi-Fi's available without any passwords, without being secured with an access password. So it's okay to connect to them to watch an uh, YouTube video, but don't use personal accounts on those networks. You know, if you plan to use personal accounts or if you are planning to uh, transmit some sensitive or work-related confidential data, 
never use an uh, public wi-fi instead always use a private wi-fi which is protected by a password and especially when you are doing some financial transactions as well keep that in mind and how about entering sensitive information so whenever you have uh, you are registering for an event or you are asked for some information to be collected and check check whether you are on a trusted wi-fi and also check whether the particular website has got this padlock this is where actually i work so we secure these connections by providing a certificate based authentication so we actually perform an https s stands for secure so always check whenever you're browsing in the internet whether you have an this green pad padded lock which indicates it's more secure and the data is encrypted between these between the client and server and check out whether you trust the vendor do you know the vendor or is it new so be careful when you're browsing online and let's talk about email security so whenever you you uh, have you get an email always uh, check who has sent the email and is it genuine or and be careful when you're downloading files and attachments because attachments can have malware in them and also be wary of those email scams where they say you have uh, uh, you have won a lottery or there are quite a few scam emails right you're all familiar with so just be wary of them and don't share sensitive information in an email and learn to spot phishing scams phishing is a special technique used by scammers for getting uh, stealing information from you so a phishing email will look, look like a real regular trusted email where the company name will be a company name that you know but the actual email address will be a different one and they normally always have a sense of urgency they'll say that credit card payment declined so act immediately update payment and this then if you just hover on this particular site you'll be able to see the exact location where it's gonna go and if you click on it it might take you to your phishing site and you will give away your information which is bad <coughs> and coming about storing information online so always look where whether i trust a service that's storing the, my information and never store any information that you think you don't want to be public because you can't trust anything any any time any breach can occur so never share anything that's sensitive publicly and to protect pass protect access to your information don't use simple passwords use passphrases which are big enough and even better off uh, set up two factor authentication or multi factor authentication and there are many many ways of multi factor authentications available like biometric based and you will later on find about fido and don't reuse your passwords and use password managers and update your passwords regularly so this is a good example of an uh, good password and a bad, bad password and when you are downloading content from the in everybody the fire alarms <laughs> so when you download from internet you'll have to uh, ensure that the source is reliable and don't download apps or music or video from dodgy sources which can contain viruses and malware and when you're sending information online make sure you know who you are sending to and be wary that emails can also be intercepted if you are using a public wi-fi kind of a thing so ensure that you are taking all the uh, needed things and encryption this is where i primarily work and encryption is like you're converting your plain text into a cipher text by uh, using a special key and only people who have the key can decrypt it back and that can secure your data in the interest of time i'm just rushing through so bear with me taking control of your data so if you can think of all the apps you have installed and just think about what data they have harvested from you if you're if you're using facebook or google or any of those g suite apps you know about the google bubble right so you might be uh, there might be heaps of information that google or facebook or any of these social media platforms know about you 
So if you look at all the apps that you use, you can figure out what kind of data each one is having. I'm sure there are many, many apps that we use on a daily basis for convenience and to connect with people. And data privacy is the field of cyber security that talks about what data is collected, shared, and used online. But how can you take control of your uh, data? Data can be shared between companies or between a person and a company. That's how when you, you don't realize how did someone get this data. And it's often sold in the dark web as well, which is unfortunate. And whenever you are uh, doing a consent make sure you read the blueprint, what data it's capturing and how that's managed. How much more have you got of this? Should we skip to the next one and then come back? Yeah. Yeah, Nara, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> so unlucky. Yeah. I think it's done. Let me finish it off so that's easy. Okay. So be mindful of what you're putting out there. Check about the company, whether it's trustworthy or not, and ask the right questions. So why are you collecting this data? How are you going to secure it? And can I request you to delete it? Would you be able to delete it for me? So just be very mindful about data that's being gathered in hospitals and any of these places. So, and there is a big data debate whether we should, uh, what should we do? Like, and there are many regulations around uh, GDPR which talk about hefty fines in case data is leaked by a company. So they have to, uh, they'll get a fine, which is a percentage of the revenue, especially in European countries. There's, there are very, very strict laws. And the last topic is careers in cybersecurity. And there is a huge cybersecurity skill gap that needs to be filled. So don't uh, there are many, many roles like security analysts, they analyze and protect your perimeter of the company against attacks and incident responders, whenever an incident occurs, they will try to respond to it. And threat intelligence is again, uh, you will know more from Holy Stock. And there are many different roles. And these are some great uh, IBMers who are not in cybersecurity prior to it. So they were like gamers and musicians, but they still moved into cybersecurity. So don't be worried if you are not, not in a cybersecurity based course. Feel free to join uh, cybersecurity events and keep learning. There is a lot of content that's available uh, within IBM websites and good luck. And I'm open for a couple of questions. I have two minutes left or did I already go out of time? I think I went off route. I'm good. I can answer your questions on the chat and we can probably move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Narayana. Uh, I think uh, in light of timing, we're kind of rushing, but if any of you have any questions in, in any time point, just uh, drop in the chat and we'll try to answer it off, right? So I think right now uh, we'll pass it to Holy. Holy is the uh, product owner of Curator. The floor is just Holy. All right, thank you. Just share my screen. Oh, good. Share my own screen. Hang on one second. All right, can we all see that okay? See the PowerPoint? Yeah, all good. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so um, pleasure to meet you all. My name's Holly Wright. I'm a product owner on Curator, which is one of the cybersecurity products that IBM has, which its main purpose is to detect threats um, for customers. So um, businesses are aware of this product and they'll, they'll deploy it in their environments and they'll use it to detect cyber attacks that are happening. 
Um, so today I want to talk to you about five pillars of cybersecurity. Um, Dale's going to go into a little bit more detail on how to actually go and detect those threats. So I won't talk too much about Curator, I'll leave that for Dale. But to start with, I'll talk more generally about the cybersecurity landscape today. So when we work with customers, there's heaps of people in IBM and their whole role is to work with customers and understand the problems that they have in cybersecurity. Um, and there are actually a lot of common themes throughout customers all over the world in all of different industries, in banking, in retail, in um, you know, government, there's common themes that show up for everyone. And generally speaking, they revolve around these four concepts. So there's too much for security analysts to do. So each day they've got too many things they need to do to go and find cyber attacks or to even just keep their systems up to date. There are too many different vendors. So that's too many different products that don't necessarily um, talk to each other. Too, many, too much complexity. So even if they do talk to each other, it's quite complex to maintain these systems. Um, and even just keeping them all up and running, keeping them updated, um, is creating a really complex environment. And they have too many alerts. So the role of a security analyst is to respond to alerts. So alerts are created when we think there's a cyber attack going on. And the job of the analyst is to come and have a look at that alert and then work out whether or not it was a real attack, what do they have to do? But they're finding that there are too many alerts being generated in the first place and they just don't have enough time in the day to actually respond to them all. And so just on the, the point of, you know, all of the different complexity and all of the different vendors that are out there, this is a graphic from probably four years ago now, and it just shows some security products. This isn't even comprehensive, but it just goes to show in each of these different categories, there are so many different companies who are providing a sort of niche um, approach to security. So, you know, there are people who specifically work on IoT security solutions. There are companies that specifically work in network and infrastructure security. Um, everybody has a piece of the security puzzle that they're trying to solve. But often what we find is those different pieces, they don't actually come together that well. You might be able to solve one little problem over here, but you've still got all of these other problems that you, you, know, you still have to come up with a solution for. And if you imagine if you're a business, if you're the, you know, the person who's responsible for the security of a company, you want to make sure that nothing's going to slip through the gaps. So it's quite confronting and quite overwhelming trying to work out how you're going to secure your environment when there's all of these different vendors at play. And each of them will tell you that you absolutely have to have their product. So what this means is that traditional security is failing. Um, there's each year there's all of these awesome reports that come out and sort of reflect on last year's cybersecurity incidents. Um, you know, what the patterns are that we're seeing, what type of attacks there are. Um, in this case, there was a few that I thought were really interesting. So it takes, and this is for Australia, on average, it takes 296 days to detect and contain a data breach. So that means it's 296 days after an attacker actually gets inside an organization before anybody detects and contains that data breach. So that's, that's pushing up close to a year almost. Um, which is crazy because it means that whole period of time they have still have access to that system. They can, you know, do further damage. They can exfiltrate more data. Um, that's a huge amount of time. In 2019, there was 8.5 billion or over 8.5 billion records compromised, um, and the average cost of the data breach was uh, 3.35 million dollars. So as a company, that's a really good number to say, look, if you get breached, it's probably going to cost you $3.35 million. Um, you might as well be pro proactively putting that money into stopping the breach from happening in the first place. Um, and one of the interesting things about that number is they actually cited security complexity as being the most expensive cost factor. So that's contributing a whole heap to what that $3.35 million. Um, and it just shows that we as an industry should be trying to make it less complex and bring these costs down. And another thing, 53% of attacks were financially motivated. So there are all different types of attacks and they can take place on all sorts of different types of systems. 
Um, the top ones for 2020 were ransomware, uh, data theft, and server apps, but there was also business email compromise. Um, insider attacks is always a really interesting one where you have somebody who is inside the company who has access to resources and they are the ones um, exfiltrating those data, that data. Um, but it just goes to show that the whole point of showing you all of this is to point out that there is not just one thing to do with cybersecurity. Um, when people think about cybersecurity, they might think, oh, you know, I don't want to reuse my passwords. And yes, you don't want to do that. That absolutely, but there's so much more than just that, right? There's uh, malware that's being developed. There's, oh, sorry, just a bit of feedback. Um, there's different malware strains coming out all the time. There's the attackers are always evolving their attacks and coming up with new ways to get access to data and get access to to companies. Um, and it's not just about stealing data. It could be personal information, it could be uh, intellectual property, so stealing blueprints, things like that. It could just be trying to take down services. So, you know, you imagine if you're in a, uh, a hacker who managed to take down Facebook, for example, that has huge implications. Um, and you weren't necessarily trying to steal data or anything like that. Your sole purpose could have been just to take down a particular service. So to combat this, there are a number of different frameworks that have come about to help companies think holistically about their cybersecurity solutions. So NIST is one of the organizations that has proposed um, sort of a framework that customers can adopt and they can measure themselves against. Because obviously, you know, because it's such a complicated problem, you want to have something that you can, you can measure yourself against and, and a way to sort of evaluate where you stand from a cybersecurity um, point of view. So the five pillars of cybersecurity that uh, NIST has outlined is identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And you can see from that graphic, it's quite a, sort of an iterative life cycle there. Um, the, the cybersecurity is never done. You never have a 100% secure environment because there's always new people coming into your organization. There's always things changing. Attackers are always changing the types of attacks that they are executing. So it's really an iterative process um, that, that goes on forever, which is awesome if you're looking for a career that is going to last a really long time. It's really good for us because it's gonna be a job that never goes away. Um, so the first pillar is identify. Um, there's a whole heap of different things that go into the identify um, portion of this. A lot of it is about just trying to understand where do you stand today? So you're reviewing, okay, well, what systems, assets, data, and capabilities do I have? And then I probably wanna know, okay, well, which ones do I care about? There are certain systems that have really valuable information on them, and I absolutely do not want those to get breached. And then there are ones that are probably you don't need to invest as much effort into. Things like finding your current weak spots, um, finding those high value targets and reviewing your current processes. So just saying, okay, well, what processes do we have already there? And it's really just a, a state of reflection and saying, okay, what do we have now? Um, and where are we strong? Where are we weak? Um, now, going back to all of the different products that exist, there are a whole heap of different products that will solve different parts of this identify pillar. So there are a whole heap of different jobs that you can do just in working in identifying risks and cybersecurity risk. There are heaps of different products you can buy just in identifying cybersecurity risks. So the next pillar is protect. Now, this is where we're trying to be proactive about preventing a cyber attack in the first place. Um, and a large portion of that comes down to your identity and access management controls. So making sure that only certain people have access to certain assets. You don't want everybody to be able to access everything. Um, if there's something that's particularly high value, you might want to implement a second factor um, or something like Jazz will talk about later with FIDO. Um, so it's really about trying to control who has access to what. Another one that people often don't think about, but a huge part of protecting an organization is actually just training your employees. Um, so I don't know if many of you, you might have done one of these training courses in the past. Often it's simple things like, you know, 
make sure you don't write your password on a post-it and um, make sure you're changing your passwords regularly. Make sure you don't give those to somebody else. Make sure you don't leave your laptop unlocked. Um, but then that sort of can be more in-depth training where you learn about social engineering and learn about the fact that, you know, people will compromise a business by putting on a high vis jacket and walking into the office um, and pretending to be someone there for maintenance. But they can go in, they can steal whatever data is available inside the office. And it's as simple as, as someone letting them in. So there's lots of training available around that as well. Um, implementation of processes, so enforcing those processes that have been created, um, and then setting up baselines of network configurations and operations so that if something goes wrong, you can recover those, those network configurations quite easily. So detect, as I mentioned, Dale, so this is the, the pillar that the product I work on fits in. Um, Dale will talk about this in a little bit more detail. So at a high level, the purpose of this pillar is to quickly find attacks in the environment. And the main way to do that is um, adopt a continuous monitoring solution that has full visibility into the environment. So that's something that sits there and it's always looking at the communication. It's always looking for attacks. This system can then uh, alert an analyst through like an offense or something like that. So you'll write some rules that say, you know, if I see this malware moving around the network, I want you to alert an analyst so they can go and respond to that. Another part of the detect pillar is verifying those alerts and being able to access all of the data required so that you can verify that. And even doing manual threat hunting. So going, looking around the system, looking for things that look a bit weird. So again, there are, there are hundreds of different products that help do this. Um, the difference is some of them will do more of it. Some of it will be more flexible. Some of them might specialize in a particular area. Um, but there are, there are so many different products that fit into the detect landscape. Respond. So the main purpose of this is a company needs to be able to contain the impact of an attack. So um, to do this, you need to have a response plan for all different types of attacks. Not every attack is the same. Each of them might require a different response. In some cases, you might need to notify authorities. You might need to tell the government. You might need to tell the police. Um, so you need to work out for each type of attack who needs to be notified and whose job is it going to be to do that? Because often, you know, people don't go ahead of time, think about, well, whose job is it to go and tell the police about this? Um, or, uh, you know, if, if we're going to, you know, do a, a press release, who's going to do the press release? Things like that. So you need to collect and analyze information about the attack and then perform whatever tasks are required to shut down the attack and also stop it happening again in the future. Now, one of the really interesting things that we do in this space is um, there's something called the cyber range where companies can come along and they can bring their staff and it's basically like a fake cyber attack. So they get put in this room and they've got all these screens in front of them. Um, they'll get, they'll be getting phone calls. They'll be getting journalists calling them up and saying, oh, we've got the inside scoop that you've just been attacked. And this can be somebody who legitimately works for the company and is trying to come up with the right answer to tell this journalist um, on the spot. And it's a really, really good way to practice the, the processes that you have put in place. So it's not just about doing it when it's, when it's live. You have to practice those beforehand um, because otherwise things can go wrong pretty quickly in those high pressure situations. And then finally, recover. So after an attack has taken place, you need to restore that data. You need to restore those services. Um, part of that just means you need to have a recovery plan in place and you need to have those backups ready to go. Um, and then also thinking further down the track, you know, if I'm attacked um, and customer data gets leaked, there is an impact to my brand as well. So part of the recovery process is also thinking about the brand impact, the legal implications and what you can do to sort of mitigate those impacts as well. So those are just the, the five different pillars, each of those have hundreds of different products that exist. And each of those products need so many different people to develop them, to uh, operate them, to just manage the people who are developing and operating them. 
And that's where this 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs comes from. So that's this year, they're estimating 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs worldwide. Um, and that, you know, that is everything from the, the developers, the architects, the analysts who are actually there. There are penetration testers, so people who are hired to try to hack into your company. Um, the executives, so everyone up to the, the CISO, research, um, people in research, people in law, like lawmakers who understand cybersecurity. There's been some really public examples of this where people who were lawyers, who were judges, just didn't understand the, the concepts that were required to have a, you know, an intelligent discussion about a cybersecurity concept. Um, government teaching, we need experts in every industry, in medicine, finance, aerospace, power, just cybersecurity isn't just an industry in its own, it's a blanket that sits across everything that we do in the world. So um, I think that's really exciting from a career perspective because you can be either learning about something completely different now and then transition into cybersecurity and all of the stuff you learned in the past is still super relevant to whatever you're doing now um, and vice versa. You can start in cybersecurity and bring that knowledge to a different industry later on. Um, I've probably gone completely over time. Yep, but <laughs> if there's any questions, I can answer them in the chat. Or if I do have time, we can answer, uh, ask them now. Yeah, thanks, Ollie. Uh, if you guys have any, any questions, you can just you know, feel free to just uh, unmute or speak up or just jump in the chat. So we're happy to answer so we can have a more interactive session. But yeah, we have one question. Sure. So the question is, why has COVID-19 affected the time it takes to detect data breaches? Um, so that's a really good question. So the what happened with um, COVID was a lot of people started working from home. So I'm at home right now. I think everybody on the call today from IBM, we're all at home now. Um, and so one of the, the things often when companies set themselves up, the office is a maybe a secure location maybe you have to have a badge to get in there when you plug your laptop in you're plugged into this sort of more secure network that is physically separate from the rest of the internet for example um, and what happened with COVID is when I started working from home a lot of companies hadn't actually set up systems to um, allow people to securely access the corporate environment which means all of a sudden they were just saying, oh, right, so tomorrow, starting from tomorrow, everybody still has to be able to access the stuff in the office. I guess we just open it up. We just make it so they can get access and we'll, we'll sort out the security side of it later. Um, so what that means is it was a lot easier for people to get into networks. Um, and yeah, and as a result, there's, there's a lot more impact in terms of people being able to legitimately or appearing to be legitimately accessing from the outside and stealing that data. And that was a lot harder for people to detect because they just, they weren't prepared for it. Good question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I personally relate with this as well. Cause like, you know, previously when doing my internship, so it's like work from home, then you know, all this kind of implication, you know, security comes into place. So yeah, I think it just, yeah. just relates to a lot of us, right? Yeah. But I think in my own time, um, I think we can move on to the next speaker. You can pass it to Bill. Yeah. Okay, cool. Hopefully you can see that. Yep, we can see it. Yep. Okay, great. All right, g'day everyone. My name is Dale Bowie. Uh, like Holly, I'm also a Curator product owner, but the area of the product that I'm dealing with is the what we call the Network Insights and Incident Forensics components. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about you know, that concept of network flow monitoring. Now, we always sort of go back to this statistic here, uh, that's 99% of cyber attacks traverse the network in some way. Now, when you think about it, you, you know, that, that might seem initially like quite a large number, but then when you think about how connected everything is these days, uh, really the only thing that we can't detect is if I have a malicious USB key and I plug it into your computer. Everything else is seen on the network in some way. And even with that malicious USB key, there's other solutions to go and detect that that would run on your laptop and, and detect it that way. So, you know, with the network monitoring, we're capturing a huge amount of data uh, and, you know, we can get a huge amount of insights out of it. 
So the uh, sort of setup that we've got here with, with Curator is we will take in a feed of log information. Now the logs can be uh, hu huge uh, variants in what, what they have and what, what they describe. So this might be something as simple as your, uh, your laptop uh, sending out details of, oh, Dale's logged into his Mac at this time. Um, and that could send back to the main you know, uh, organization that you're, you're connected to. Um, and it, it can get a lot more complicated as well. So as you, you know, log into Zoom today, you've, you've accessed a Zoom system. Uh, and Zoom has done some logging of, of your access there. And, you know, it, it's got all our names and, uh, you know, information about where we've come from and where we're going. And, um, you know, they would all log together to centralized systems. Now, on the network flow side, we're just looking at the packets on the, on the network. We're not necessarily, we don't necessarily have control of, you know, the, the Zoom server, for instance, um, or, or, any, or any of the, the servers, really. Um, we might have control of the network, though. So case in point is, um, you know, one of those untrusted Wi-Fi services uh, that, you know, got brought up before. Uh, I could run a Wi-Fi service for people and I could snoop on everything they do. Um, you know, that, that's all technically possible. And especially with the unsecured ones, um, I don't even need to be the owner of that uh, Wi-Fi network and I can snoop on everything you do. I just need to be in the rough vicinity. So that's where network monitoring sort of comes in is we, we can look at the packets and we try and uh, break it down to a, a great level of insight that we get, we get out of the data there. So it starts off with being just, you know, this IP contacts this IP, uh, but then it can really build up to, oh, well, um, Dale sent this file to Holly, Holly downloaded it, as soon as Holly downloaded it, we saw that spawn off a whole heap of other connections. Um, and we think, you know, based on, you know, that, that pattern, uh, there's some suspicious, yeah, some suspicious behavior as a result of that. The last tile there is incident forensics. Now it's the same sorts of things that I said before, but ultimately what we're relying on there is an after the fact. So uh, everything before that was in that detect phase. Uh, incident forensics is more in the response phase. So we rely on basically a record of everything that happened on the network, which takes a huge amount of data um, on, on servers to store that. Uh, but we can go back to a point in time and say, hey, we know something suspicious happened on this IP within this uh, time window. Tell me what happened. And we can go back and basically reconstruct everything that happened at that point in time. Now, before encryption and things like that, we were able to you know, even reconstruct the web pages that you were viewing and see where you clicked on the web pages. And all of that's just through the packets themselves. Now encryption has you know, helped uh, mitigate a lot of that functionality these days, but um, you know, the, the concept still stands. If it's, if it's on the network, uh, then someone can look at it in, in some way, shape or form. So these are our sort of key use cases for something like the uh, Curator Network Insights uh, that, that I work on. So, we're looking for advanced threats, whether that's malware uh, that we, where we already know, you know, this particular file hash is bad, or it could be an unknown threat as well. Um, you know, that, that as just some suspicious attachment to an email uh, has come in and the user's clicked on some things and, uh, you know, that's triggered some other alerting. Um, so we might be able to piece together that puzzle. We can also do some threat hunting. So that's where you don't really know, uh, you're just looking for suspicious things. You're not necessarily, um, you know, you don't know what you're looking for at the start, uh, but it, it's, it's a process of sifting through all that data and finding, you know, things that might be uh, interesting. To... Uh, incident response, I sort of touched on that already, but uh, try and, once we know something bad's happened, how do we go from that, that trigger to, uh, you know, an actual uh, response, whether that's a full recovery to the system, you know, if a hacker got in, can we kick them out? And then can we clean up and make sure that they're not still in the system? Um, lateral movement. So once someone gets in, uh, you know, into an organization, say a hacker gets in, uh, first thing they're going to want to do is they're going to want to try and have some persistence in that network so that if they do lose that one connection, they've got another way in later. Um, and one of the best ways of doing that is to spread out across the network. Right? See how many places you can, you can get connected to and open up those sort of back doors from. So that's where lateral movement comes in. Data exfiltration. So that's when, you know, once they've found the, the goods, the, the, the things that they're really looking for, uh, actually taking it off, off that network and uh, taking it elsewhere. Um, you know, 
a, a, one of the things that's happened a lot in the last year was um, ransomware is converted to being not just encrypt the data on the system, but encrypt it and take it away as well. Um, so that you know the ransomware uh, operators have sort of two, two ways of getting money out of people. One, through the decryption of the data that they leave behind, or two, uh, the sale of that data uh, on, the, on the public internet. Last one is a more simple one, and that's just asset profiling. So, you know, do you know what's on your network? Uh, do, you, do you know uh, what devices, uh, what types of devices you've got rather, and how they behave? So to put this sort of more in terms that hopefully other people want, uh, everyone will sort of understand, uh, I'm gonna talk about monitoring at home. So uh, about two years ago now, maybe 18 months, I decided to deploy our enterprise software at home and uh, run it on my home network and you know, see what I can find. Uh, this was put both from my own uh, benefit of, you know, how, does a, how does a user of our product actually use the product? Um, but also, you know, what sort of, what, what does a real world data uh, work, you know, look like in, in the product? So that's sort of why I did it. Um, and you can do this as well. So our software uh, comes with what we call the community edition, Curator Community Edition. Uh, and uh, that is completely free. You can download it from the internet now. Uh, you basically just need to find an old device that you've got uh, to install it on. Um, there are you know, some minimum spec requirements for that. And the way I actually started uh, doing this, and this was all entirely for free, is I grabbed two Cat5 cables and I worked out how to splice them together such that I could create a network tap. So basically I would have one network cable going along like normal or seemingly like normal and then another cable coming off the side of it uh, that is the mirror of all the traffic. And that was my uh, very poor attempt at splicing those together just by you know, cracking it open and uh, twisting those wires together. Now you can go and buy uh, devices that do this for about $20, but you know, this was my hack to get it working straight away. So now I'll look at some of these use cases again in that home environment. So the first one, asset profiling. So Upon plugging uh, you know, the, the, the software into my network, I was able to build up this big asset profile of these are all my devices. Now I'm in a household of uh, five people here and uh, you know, we've got you know, something like 50, 60 devices in the house, which uh, is possibly on the high side for, for some people. But once you start to think about it a little bit more, you know, you've got your phone, you've got, you might have a tablet, you might have a laptop, uh, you might have a gaming device. Uh, you might have a Google Home or a, a Google Chromecast, and then suddenly, you know, you times that by the number of people, and you know that, that number of devices really does grow large. And some of these, um, you'll see, you know, when, when you're looking at these lists, uh, you might not necessarily uh, realize what those devices actually are. You know, it might have been a friend that you let access to the Wi-Fi at one point, or um, it might be a device that you thought you'd long got rid of, but it, it, you know, it's still connected in some way. Um, so one of the things you can do with the software is as soon as a new device is brought onto the network, you can alert on it. So that's useful um, for tracking down, you know, something that may have guessed your Wi-Fi password and is now in the network or something you, you, don't, uh, you didn't realize was being introduced into your network. Uh, we can also start to profile what services are running on those devices. So uh, in this particular case, I've looked at the traffic going to my router and you can see DNS and DHCP are the uh, two common uh, services that are being queried for, which makes perfect sense, right? That, that's what my, my router or my gateway is doing. Um, but in much the same way, I can start to work out which devices uh, are laptops, which devices are phones, um, and how devices are communicating between each other as well. Uh, on the threat hunting side, I guess where I sort of started was, um, We've got all these application detections. Um, so we'll say DNS, HTTPS, things like that that we've observed in the network traffic. What I did to start off was, you know, what, what's in the other category? So what's, what are the things that uh, Curator didn't detect? And how can I, you know, enhance it such that it can detect those things? And the first sort of category of things that uh, we didn't really have detections for was broadcast packets. So, uh, I'm on this Wi-Fi network now, and my laptop's probably sending broadcast packets to every other device on this network. So think about this in your public Wi-Fi case as well. All the broadcast packets are going to everybody. Um, you don't even need to you know, hack the network, so to speak. Uh, that's just the nature of how these packets are designed, and that's the nature of how these applications are designed. 
Um, so you can actually look and you can determine which devices on your network are running Spotify because they'll beam out a little beacon to say, hey, I'm here, are you a, an associated application? Uh, same deal with Dropbox and I'm sure other file sharing technologies because they do sort of local network peer-to-peer -peer share. So if you've got two devices with the same Dropbox account on them, rather than pushing it up to the, the uh, internet and then downloading it again from the internet, it'll just push it directly to the device. Um, same thing with Windows updates. Uh, you know, one, one, one Windows uh, host can download the updates for the entire network and distribute it for, through that. So, um, you know, you can get a lot of information about the devices running on your network, even without, you know, having that splice cable that I showed before. Now, I said before, a lot more traffic is becoming encrypted, uh, and that's true. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily all, uh, you know, private and secure in, in all senses. Uh, now, this is getting better and fewer sites are, you know, susceptible to this, uh, you know, as, as more and more adopt the latest encryption standards. Um, but you can see, you know, I, I've worked out all the different domains that, uh, you know, my, my environment was communicating with. Uh, and these were all HTTPS secure with the padlock connections. Uh, but I was still able to work out what websites I was going to uh, through that. So, uh, you know, th there is a level of protection you know, absolutely, go, always go for the sites that are HTTPS and secure, but don't get that confused with necessarily that it's private connection um, because people can still see the sites you're communicating to. Now I've got a few Google Homes in this uh, household um, and using the network monitoring stuff, I was curious as to what they were doing. Uh, so, you know, there's sort of a pattern that you observe with Google Home devices. Uh, First, they ping the DNS server uh, on 8.8.8.8. They then do a DNS query for google.com, which they don't seemingly uh, you know, need to do other than for this HTTP request that is just a simple HTTP 204 return. So all of that was just, do we have internet connectivity? Now in normal operation, um, you know, th that's pretty much it. But the other bit that they have is this long lived HTTPS connection to a Google server. Now I'm not saying that they're always listening, always monitoring, but it's, you know, it's suspicious that there's a connection there when the claim is that only when I say those key words that I'm not gonna say because they'll light up in the room here, um, that, you know, that, that data will be transferred at that point. So data exfiltration, uh, it's a little hard to detect this because you know, with HTTPS, we can see you know, a large upload going to a particular host. Um, so one example, not at home that I've seen, but actually in office environments is large uploads going to YouTube. Um, I'm not sure what the office use case is for that, but um, we are able to, to determine that it's a, you know, a file upload going to YouTube based on where it's going. And basically the amount of data that's being pushed in the direction of that server versus the amount of data that's being downloaded. So when you're watching a YouTube video, most of the data is coming towards you, uh, but when you upload it, it's the opposite. So some customers choose to do a man in the middle. So that would uh, essentially break the encryption uh, temporarily such that they can look at everything that's going on inside. Uh, but there's a lot of things that have to you know, align for that to work. Uh, now, you know, uh, for IBM, we might have something like that um, because all our devices are managed by IBM. Uh, same sorts of things if you go to other, other enterprises where the company owns those devices, it does make it possible for that encryption to be broken. You can also track suspicious IP addresses in general. Um, this is not necessarily the best way because some services are shared IP addresses. Uh, so that, you know, does complicate things. Uh, but, you know, it, going back to home example here, my phone's communicated with all sorts of different IP addresses that I don't understand. Um, uh, there was also this case where it was uh, triggered for a command and control server, but that was just a misclassification of an IP address because Twitter was being used as a command and control server for a particular attack. So when my phone communicated with Twitter, it was flagged as communicating with command and control. The other thing you can do is look at non-HTTPS connections. So, uh, you know, not everything is encrypted. Um, and in this particular case, I found an instance where some of my personal information was going over a clear text uh, connection uh, to an Australian streaming service application. Um, so that, that was rather interesting discovery and I've stopped using that application. And yeah, 
that's actually it for me. Um, so are there any questions about monitoring at home or network monitoring in general? Um, yeah. Yeah, feel free to drop your questions. So we have Dale to answer your questions on network and everything regarding cybersecurity. Okay, it's all quiet. I don't see anything in the chat, so I may have may have confused some people or lost them. But um, yeah, yeah. over the information overload coming in. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I think it's fine. No worries. We can uh, pass it to um, Jasmine. To continue. All right, that sounds good to me. Yeah. Let me just kick off my screen sharing. All right, can you guys see that PowerPoint? Yeah, we can see it. All right, awesome. So um, as mentioned before, uh, my name is Jasmine Smith. Um, I work in identity and access management. And the way I like to describe that is we're checking that you are who you say you are and you're allowed to do the action you're trying to do, right? And so I've been working in that field for uh, probably over seven years now and um, really excited about where it's going. And today that's what I'm gonna talk to you about. But I wanna, I wanna try out these reaction things. Can we get some reactions, like some thumbs up if you guys have heard of um, OTP? Cool, Holly's head of OTP. We've got some other people who've head of OTP. Excellent, excellent. Um, have you heard of FIDO before? All right, we've got we've got a no, we've got a, a shocked face. All right. Excellent, excellent. New content for you guys here today. Exciting stuff. All right. So um, just as a little bit of background information, um, there is a organization called the FIDO Alliance. Um, they're a group of um, industry individuals, companies that are really working together to try and get the world to a place where we no longer need passwords. And so um, they're really driving forward this passwordless effort. And so um, why would we wanna do that, right? What's, what's wrong with passwords? We've, we've already heard a few issues with them today, but just to really spell it out to you guys, um, you might not realize a lot of websites that you have accounts with are absolutely using password practices that are outdated and old. Um, it was only in the last couple of years that NIST went through and updated their password recommendations, but I've not seen any of my account websites update that. You know, they're all still asking for, oh, you have to include one special character. You have to include a number. Um, some of them still have restrictions on password length. We know now that those are not good passwords. Good passwords are long passwords. However, the problem with that, right? Long passwords are harder to remember. So what do everyday consumers that aren't too security conscious, what do they do? They reuse their passwords. We've already seen today about how that is a very bad idea. If your password is stored on a server and it's not got the best security and it gets exposed, if you've used that password everywhere, potentially all of your accounts are exposed. Um, we've also already today talked about phishing. So um, phishing attacks are getting more and more, um, what's the word, complex and intelligent. I've seen some very well done phishing emails for Amazon recently. It's very worrying, but that's again where we're trying to step in and make sure that uh, we're number one, protecting you guys from phishing emails, but also giving you alternatives to passwords so that your accounts are more secure. And thirdly, more on what Dale's been kind of speaking on, interception. If you're using a dodgy Wi-Fi network, someone might be sitting there observing what's going on. If someone's sending your password over clear text, they can grab that. And passwords, you don't really change them often, right? Um, we as, as corporate uh, employees, we have fairly strict password policies where we have to change our password every three months. But again, how many other services are doing that? So there's these long lived secure things that can be intercepted, people can use to, to break into your accounts. So what do we as an industry do? We started setting up OTPs, we started setting up passcodes. So you might recognize these from getting SMSed or emailed a six digit passcode that you then need to type into the website after you've signed in with your username and password. 
So that's called second factor. It's a second factor of assurance that you are who you say you are. Um, however, again, we've got some issues here, right? So SMS usability, um, what if you've got coverage issues? There's no guaranteed delivery there. There might be a delay. Um, it costs per user. Um, it's, it, it works, but it doesn't work well enough for uh, very widespread usage, right? Um, then there's device usability. So what I'm talking about there is, um, it's kind of being phased out now, but previously with banks and um, Blizzard did it, this as well, they had these little hardware tokens you could get where you press a button and it generates the six digit token for you. So sure, you're not having the coverage issues and the delays there, but you would generally only have one of those hardware tokens per site. Um, they were also expensive. You had to pay for them and they're, they're fragile. What if the battery dies and then you're locked out of your account? So then you really need to concentrate in that flow on the um, account recovery, which is generally a customer service experience, which costs more money. Um, thirdly, the, the user experience isn't that crash hot, right? So if you don't have your phone on you straight away and you're not expecting to have to do that SMS OTP, then you've got to go find your phone, you've got to open your text messages, uh, copy or read off that six digit code and chuck it into the website. Um, so what companies had to do, right, is they had to expand out how long that OTP is valid for. I've had some that have been valid for like five or 10 minutes. Plenty of time for a hacker to come in, or sorry, a, a bad actor to come in and use that token before you can, right? Um, and it, it, ne that's exactly following on to the next point, which is they're fishable. Um, more and more we're finding people get into these workarounds where they are able to spoof your phone number and set up these SMS OTPs on their own devices and things like that. Um, the, the attackers are getting smarter and so we need to get smarter too, right? And so in 2014, that's where we started with sort of security keys. So a bit like those hardware tokens that you could press a button and you get that six digit code, but different, right? These are highly secure and meant to be the like anti-phishing solution. And the way they do that is using public key cryptography. So what happens on a registration or an authentication flow is that um, the server, it uh, decides on basically like a string of characters of random nonce. It sends that to this device. The device signs that nonce, sends it back, and then the server can then validate that signature. It's, it's highly secure. It's not replayable. It's, it's bloody brilliant, right? Um, and one of the key features of these devices is that you could use one security key for multiple sites. So you're not locked into having to buy multiple of these, which is a huge cost. Now these are expensive, right? But they're easy to use. Um, you can see here, uh, my, my sort of favorite of these original security keys is the um, YubiKey. So you would plug that into your USB port and hit this handy little metal contact here and it would just work. So simple, so easy. Um, there are a few different variants on that, you know, so they're not all USB. Some of them were Bluetooth capable, some of them were NFC. Um, and what, what was really, I think the start of this cool tech was that it was being standardized. So being standardized by the FIDO Alliance and it was called uh, U2F, so universal second factor. However, and the reason why they're not so widespread these days is they again had some issues, right? There were some challenges. So while this was sort of the beginning of the standardization journey in my mind, um, the Java, underlying JavaScript API that was required to get this working, it wasn't supported across all browsers. Um, I think Chrome might've been one of the first browsers to jump on board there. Firefox slowly did as well, but the uptick in support there wasn't rapid enough to see widespread usage of this. Um, also, the only things that were supported were these security keys that were built by a vendor to conform to that specific that that communication specification, which I'll talk about in another second. So there weren't any sort of authenticators in general that could be used here. Um, and also, U2F was really only second factor still. So you would still need to type in your username and password, and instead of using SMS or email OTP you would use um, one of those devices instead. You couldn't go fully to passwordless with the U2F spec. So that's kind of where FIDO2 comes into play. 
So it was the next evolution of U2F and uh, really designed to support authentication of just about any type. And I've got some examples coming up on the next slide. Um, but one of the cool key things is that it supported first factor, second factor, as well as multi-factor. So you could use it to replace the username password experience. And the, the key security part of all this all, it's, it was still, it's still using that strong hardware-based authentication using public key cryptography. So let's 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 go through what this sort of uh, what the how the technology all fits together, right? So we've got our end user over on the left. We've got some client devices in the middle. So that's either your browsers. So we've got a nice little collage up there of Firefox, Chrome, Explorer, and Safari. Um, they could your client device could also be an app. Um, then over to the right, we've got our web auth and relying parties. So this is sort of the technical term for uh, websites that are relying on the user's identity, they, they're wanting to authenticate the user, right? So we've got some examples here like Dropbox, Facebook, Google, fairly, fairly big services, right? So U2F was mainly based on roaming authenticators. So there's little hardware authenticators, the key smart cards, phones that used USB, Bluetooth or NFC. Um, and they communicated to browsers via the CTAP1 protocol. So that's a client two authenticator protocol, you know, nice and straightforward there. Um, but that protocol was U2F, it was second factor only. So uh, with FIDO2, we also um, sort of uh, standardized CTAP2. So this is the uh, specification between roaming authenticators and client devices that could describe um, not just how to do second factor, but also that first factor and multi-factor experiences, right? Then the other piece of this is the web author piece. So we've got over on the right here instead um, to communicate between the browser and the relying party, um, the, the sort of standard specification there is called web author. So FIDO2 is made up of CTAP2 and web author. And web in itself is a separate specification. And so what this enabled here was uh, platform authenticators to be used as well, instead of just roaming authenticators. So a platform authenticator is an authenticator that lives on the, the platform that you're currently using. So I'm, I'm looking across at my Mac at the moment. So it's, it's Windows Hello, it's the Mac touch bar with fingerprint, it's Android device Authn, um, probably even Face ID with iOS these days, that sort of thing. So this is the cool piece to me because it's technology that consumers already have. It's technology that consumers might already be using to log into their devices. And so we can make this experience really easy um, for these end consumers that might not be security conscious so that they can um, have these secure login experiences without having to become cybersecurity experts. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's sort of a fairly quick rundown on FIDO2 and um, what it is. Um, it's an open authentication standard. So the web author piece is backed by the World Wide Web Consortium, Dub3C. So originally it did start off as a FIDO Alliance specification, but um, with the uh, increased interest from vendors, and everyone's really jumping on board very quickly this time compared to U2F. It got moved out into a Dub3C specification instead, which is where the web author terminology came in instead. Um, it's on track to be supported by all platforms and all browsers. And there's a huge test matrix across like Safari, Chrome, Firefox, and then those working with Windows Hello, those working with Mac. Uh, Mac OS, that sort of stuff, huge test matrix they've got. Um, it's been exciting to watch that matrix turn more, more green over the last year. And it allows for that choice of authentication devices. If you've got a Windows Hello enabled device, if you've got a um, Mac that has the touch bar fingerprint, the, the consumer can choose to use those to log into their accounts now but it's still backed by that incredibly strong security, that public key cryptography, where no secrets are being stored on the server. The server's not a honeypot that someone can go across to and grab all this information and spread it and hack into other accounts. Um, it eliminates so many of the risks of phishing and all forms of password theft and replay attacks. You can't replay 
these authentication or registration flows because it's that secure nonce, because it's that um, that being signed and then verified by the server. Um, you, you can't replay those. And my, my favorite part of all this is the ease of use, right? It's driverless. People don't need to install anything to get this working. Um, you can use it for multiple websites just using the one piece of technology. You don't have to buy multiple things. Um, and it allows for not just second factor, but also passwordless authentication. So um, I hope that gave you guys a bit of an insight into where we're going with user accounts and getting rid of passwords entirely. Um, we will still need passwords for a little while yet while we get consumers um, bootstrapped into all this. Um, I'm part of an effort with the FIDO Alliance to try and see how we can convince uh, consumers how this is so easy while still being secure because that's a really hard idea for people to get their minds around. Like if it's too easy, it doesn't feel secure, right? But this really is that easy. Um, and yeah, it's, it's gonna be exciting to see uh, how we can kind of drag you guys on board with this. Um, were there any questions? Let me see if I can pull up chat. Yeah, I think we'll just, uh, if you have any questions, you can just, you know, just drop in the chat. I think it's very interesting to see how, you know, uh, from, maybe from a password perspective, we go to a feature where, you know, we do need password. I think you know very looking forward to the, when the time comes. So yeah, yep. I think that's one question. So if FIDO2 is an open standard, what's from stopping third-party manufacturers from not fully complying with the standards in their hardware security keys? So the so especially hardware security keys, they have to go through a certification process where they prove that they are following the specification before they're allowed to even take their devices to market, for example. So the FIDO Alliance is very heavily involved in that piece and making sure that vendors aren't having bad security practices and things like that. Um, it's also really interesting because there's sort of three actors within a flow, right? There's the, the hardware piece, whether they're roaming authenticators or platform authenticators. There's the browser itself and it following the specification in terms of communicating to those devices as well as to the relying party. And then there's the relying party, that server that's wanting to authenticate the user. So all three of these entities are um, most likely FIDO certified and um, following the specifications, right? There have been a few issues where browsers have chosen to implement the spec in slightly different ways. And it's very much a collaborative effort to try and get everyone to the same place on that. Yeah, sounds good. Um, do you have any more questions? If, if not, I think we can pass it to Sunil for the last session where Sunil will talk to us about more about adaptive access. Sure, thanks. Uh, let me just quickly share my screen. Okay. All right. So I'm here to talk about the adaptive access offering that we have in the product called IBM Security Verify. So in terms of the goals of adaptive access, let's take a look at what are we trying to do. So as part of this talk, while I also highlight what's available in the IBM product, I'll also try to make this generic enough for us to understand what are the things in play to get this solution working. So let's say you're building a secure solution for your company's users to access third-party applications like a federated single sign-on. So as an IT manager for a very large organization, the goal would be that you want all your legitimate users to be able to smoothly access the third-party apps. At the same time, you want to protect it so that if there is a fraudulent user, you want to prevent them from accessing these apps. And the experience should be near seamless as much as possible, meaning that on a Monday morning when all your employees or say the university students are trying to log into the system, they shouldn't get unnecessarily challenged for 
a second factor authentication, like a security code to their phone, etc. If they have not done any, if there are no significant changes in the device or, or their access patterns. So let's go to the next one. So when we build usually adaptive access systems, so you can think of it as systems that respond actively to the usage pattern, meaning that you don't have some fixed set of you know, parameters in play. It sort of adapts itself based on the situation. And many of the organizations which deal with say the, the finance industry in particular, they are very much concerned that their users data or their accounts are not compromised. So they have a they have a goal of making the system safe at the same time convenient for users. So if you're going to keep challenging your regular users with too many second factor challenges and they're going to say that it's tough to use the website and that's again a negative reaction. So let's say you want to build a solution or a system that sort of studies what are the parameters involved when somebody accesses a system. And let's talk about a web-based um, web -based product, which takes a username password before it lets the user through. So what, what can we do in fact to understand if this is an existing user or is this a new user or is the user coming in from a new device or is there a significant change in the behavior of the user? So if you take a browser-based flow, you can look at some parameters that are available, let's say, for example, from JavaScript or any other technology that you can think of. So some of the common things that you have accessible are the version of the browser, including at what build number they are. You can get an access to the country, the state, city they are from. You can know what operating system they are from. So this is, uh, as a developer, what you can do is you can build a system where you can model your database or a backend that keeps track that for the first time a user comes through can I keep track of all these things in their record? So the second time the request is done, you have that data in your backend system and you can compare that. I mean, is it the same browser that they're coming in from or did it change the state or city? And is this a new operating system? So these are very obvious uh, parameters that you can come up with with some thought, but how can we make this even more secure. So that's where IBM Security Verify comes in and they add what is called as web behavioral biometrics. So what this really means is, can we study the pattern of usage? Especially, can we look at keystrokes? Can we look at mouse movements? So, of course, all this uh, for all this uh, process, you need to grab consent from the user before you do this. And this is what all banks do when they roll out a new version of the app or, or there is a significant change in the website, they send you the updated terms and conditions that say that they're going to actually access all these uh, data. So it's interesting to note that every user has a certain unique pattern when they type their username and password. So it can be the time gap between the keystrokes. And if it is a mouse movement, it can be the way they move their mouse. What are the common patterns that they do? So instead of getting into the specifics of what we do in the product, uh, if you can think of as a developer, what should you do? you can come up with an algorithm that sort of tracks all these things and builds a mathematical model 
you can sort of maybe assign a a score a risk score if you will for these users so you can say that if the normal behavior is seen this will be the range of the risk score if there is something deviating from those standard patterns for example i can see the mouse move is so rapid that it is almost impossible for a human user to do that it looks more like a a script which is repeatedly trying to do some gui based actions so in that case can you build a mathematical model that will increase the risk score such that you can clearly identify that if if the score is between say 6 and 10 that means the the user presents or the session presents a high risk so this forms the fundamental aspect of a uh, risk score based access and of course when you want to present this to the end user or or an it administrator you want to make this as simple as possible for them so you can present them with a screen which says if the risk score of the user is low what action do you want to do so it'll be something like if it is low just let them through if it is medium you might want to do something like challenge them with a two factor so they might be forced to enter a passcode or look at an email for a one time passcode that you send if it is high high risk what exactly do you want to do do you want to totally block them or do you want to just make them do some more um step up actions and validate that they are indeed the user then maybe you can pose some questions and say answer these questions which you create when you filled up when you created your profile things like that so that's how you generally build security products and if the score is very high then you might want to say you know let's block this user because it it doesn't even look anything like their previous behavior and especially if it's the financial the domain you don't want a uh, a fraudulent user to come and access the account and start doing transactions so in terms of a product think of how you want to present this to the end user administrator you might want to allow them to create policies saying that this is what i want to do with my users with the various risk levels so you can go back to what i said earlier there are i mean the mathematical models around giving a risk score based on parameters you know that that's a vast topic but you can just think of it that whatever is the parameter that you are trying to build your score on it will finally yield a number and you can determine what that number means but when you present it to the end user you like to make it very simple you say that like for example in our product we have these as the default so low low medium mfa that means step up only for that session so if he's coming in as a medium user just for that session alone challenge him with a with a request for a one time password if the score comes in as high for example you see a users city change rapidly from say one city to another city where it is not possible for a user to travel say in 30 minutes between the two cities then you might want to say every time this user logs in always challenge him because there is something wrong with the pattern of usage and in in cases of very high risk you might say let's just block this user let him reach out to the customer support and then they can work out what's wrong or what what is the next steps for this user again when you build um uh, security products you want to make it as simple as possible especially for the administrator you want to help them to decide what what the various behaviors are which are possible and uh, what should i do so in our product we have a policy rule engine which says if a user is coming in with a new device 
So you can create a policy says detect that it is a new device. So it is something that is expected that somebody might have bought a new phone or they're accessing it from their new tablet. But then you need to have a policy around that. You'll say, if it's new device, then step up. And in this case here, we say then MFA per session as shown here. That means if a new device is detected, let's challenge. Similarly, these are just uh, some sample list of parameters that you can build your condition around. So new geolocation, is he coming in from a new city or a geography or a new country? He might be traveling and accessing, but still what should I do with that? Risky device. So there are ways for you to go ahead and find out uh, whether the device is jailbroken if if they have you know wiped out the manufacturer's operating system and it's a rooted device so what should you do with such devices do you want to allow it or you want to totally block it for your website because rooted devices can't be trusted and you don't want to be held accountable um, for the consequences when a customer loses a large amount of money in, in many countries, the bank or the financial organization is responsible for lost money there. So you might, you might opt to totally block him out and ask him to come back with a non-rooted device. Risky connection. So security products have a database of uh, events that happen. So like Holly and Dale mentioned in their, in their talk, this database can be built upon. So certain IPs can have a reputation that it's known that hackers use this particular network to you know, target their um, requests from. So if that connection is risky and it is known that, then do you want to do some drastic step like block them out? Certain ISPs, as you can see, they're, they're known to be uh, favorites favorites of hackers, so can we block that? And uh, certain IP ranges are risky. And is there a behavioral anomaly? This is again the mathematical model that we talked about earlier. Can you say that if there is a certain mouse movement for a user and you've tracked that in a, in a mathematical model and suddenly you're seeing that the, the mouse movement is totally something that is uh, not seen in the past. I mean, it may be that the user is doing something weird this time, but you're trying to increase the score. So what can we do with that? So these are some of the things that can be done. You can go further on to say that, you know, depending on the kind of add-ons you have, depending on the fix pack of the browser, what are the steps that you need to do? So some examples. Again, when you build these models, you can look at uh, the various authentication factors that you can have. So you want to make the experience seamless. So you can say that if it's a new device, it's all right. It's, it's expected that people can suddenly use a new device. And you might just decide that just uh, use email OTP, which is not the most secure, but it's still just one level above allowing access. For example, somebody can gain access to your email account. So if your risk score is high and you just say, challenge them with an email OTP, it might still be risky because a hacker can gain access to their email accounts. You might want to do something more secure like FIDO2 saying, if this is a really high risk score, can I just uh, challenge a FIDO2 challenge so that unless the person who really has that physical device, they are not able to pass the challenge. That means a hacker most probably uh, cannot pass the challenge. And there are other things like voice OTP that you receive on the phone. Like somebody, you just receive a call and the call spells out the OTP, it just pronounces the OTP. And there is IBM Verify, which is an IBM product, which is like an app which is used to generate these passwords where you need to register and things like that. So these are the various ways you can build your system around. And uh, we can also do things like building combination of these conditions. 
Um, so when you, as a web developer, try to present a, a user-friendly way of configuring these uh, conditions, you can provide these combinations. You can say, if a new device is detected and the remote IP is from one of these ranges, then you may want to block because it's very, from history, you know that this particular IP range, I mean, in this example, although we just talk about one IP, you can have a subnet, you can say this whole range of IPs, uh, just block them. So these are the various ways in which you can present and uh, manage risk. And again, from an administrator standpoint, they may have thousands of users logging in and they want to make sure about how their systems are functioning. So here we have some reports that we present to the user and they can further drill down. So if a particular user got an MFA challenge, you can just quickly go and look, you know, what's the reason? Is their score coming up high? And uh, may, perhaps it is because of their ISP or their location change. And these are the ways where you can, you can sort of present raw data that is there in the backend to the end user. So when, when they buy the product uh, for a fee, they immediately realize the value of it. And ob obviously the graph also helps because you can filter and uh, come up with uh, various representations and, you and the administrator can work with the user saying that, hey, looks like uh, you were blocked from the system. So for example, in this case, you can see that somebody has come in with a very high score and they got denied. So a good IT system should always be proactive. So you must reach out to the end user saying, it looks like you signed in with your Samsung internet device and you were blocked. Are you having trouble with logging in? So these are the ways where adaptive access plays a role in, a role in making the life better for the end users. So let's uh, quickly jump to a demo where, which I talked about. We'll see how the system is able to identify a new user. And uh, because it's new, we want to make sure it's really the user. We want to present a challenge to the end user. And then again, uh, monitor the user's access pattern to see if they are being led through. So I'll just quickly jump over to demo here. So out here we are seeing how an end user is signing into the system for the very first time. So they got signed up and they're entering their username and password. They log in. Once they log in, they go about their web app. So they are presented with their dashboard and they reach their favorite app and they, they try to sign into that. So because it's a new user, the system is sort of detecting that. The So we'll just first have a look at how we have configured the end user's application. So we're, we've seen that this OIDC app is the app that they're using to access and we can attach policies. you go and see that the user has signed on to a policy which has a risk score based policy. We talked about how you can build such policies and you've attached those policies to those apps. So now those users are trying to log into the system and let's have a look at the policy itself. So we want to see how such a policy is configured by the administrator. So it's again the same thing that we talked earlier where based on the risk score of the user, the administrator is presented with some default choices and they can always go back and change that if they want. So now that it's done, the user clicks on the app and the system detects that this is a brand new entry because it's the first time the user is coming through. So perhaps it's good to ask 
are you really that user? So they've been sent an SMS OTP. Once the user, genuine user receives it on their phone, they enters the code, they enter the code and then they are led through. So now the user is able to access the website and that's all good. So let's say the user now comes back and then clicks on the, the app again. He's led through directly to the website without any challenges. And as an administrator, you can always go back and look at the report just to make sure how your users are doing because that's part of the job of an administrator to make sure that the users are not facing any undue uh, challenges of MFA. You see that the user has come in for the first time. It's a new device, which is shown as true. So he's been challenged. And in the next instance, he's allowed because he passed the MFA. And the reason here is mentioned that he's passed the MFA. So these are various ways in which you can utilize these mathematical models and transfer that into a uh, into a website where users are benefited. So over time, an administrator gets a view of how well his website is doing. So if there are greens, mostly it's all good because most number of users are being led through. At the same time on a particular day, if, he's, he, if he can filter further down into a high or very high user base, and then try to track, you know, is there a reason why all these users are getting high scores? And uh, do we, are we under some kind of attack? Is everybody coming under some kind of threat? So these are the ways by which you can um, use risk-based systems to help your users be protected and yet have a near seamless uh, user experience. So, that brings to uh, to an end the demo that I had. Are there any uh, questions? I can have a look at the chat. Yeah, uh, feel free to ask any questions. I think that's a pretty you know, in-depth demo or like, you know, how, how do we deal with all this kind of stuff? Sure. Anything generic also you can ask? Yeah, you can ask about the topics itself. You can ask them though. Uh, how's the real like how's the in the career in cyber security right? yeah anything that's on top of mind yeah sure feel free to either uh, post the question or you can just talk um, on the chat um, any question on any presentation or any general cyber security question that you may have we have uh, our five colleagues available and i guess we have uh, just a few more minutes yeah if not i think um we want to move to Narana for the conclusion. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll I'll probably just uh, wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, for us. Okay. So first of all, uh, thank you guys for the opportunity, and uh, I hope that this was uh, a good session, and you're able to have some good takeaways. And we we are looking at having some kind of a good uh, relationship going forward, where we can have these kind of interlocks with the university and uh, we can discuss things going forward um, and as as we saw today we we first had narayana who talked about the fine-grained aspects of how communications are done and then holly talked about the various aspects of cyber security and how do you um, analyze when an incident happens the various carriers that exist there and dale then showed us about how do you do forensics, meaning once uh, network activity happens, um, how are you able to go dig deeper and find out you know, what's, what's the underlying cause of things that happen. And we had Jasmine who explained about the new standard FIDO and how passwords uh, are slowly going to get phased out and probably with the new hardware keys, um, you know, how we're trying to make things better and more secure. I didn't have a so, question uh, for yep. Mark. Yeah, he asked like, you know, it's gener gener on a general high level view, how do you work towards a career in, in cybersecurity? Uh, is that on the chat, sorry? Yeah, it's on the chat. 
I can take part of this answer. I guess all of us have come from different backgrounds, right? So we're all in cybersecurity development. So we build the products. Now, that might be somewhat aliasing at first. Like you might think, oh, you have to be, you know, incredibly skilled at you know, mathematics to understand all the, all the, you know, the true encryption that goes behind the scenes. But that's not necessarily the case, right? A lot of the things that we do are much the same as any other software developer. Um, we're just practicing in the field of cybersecurity that, you know, helps everybody. Um, you know, for me personally, I did a degree in IT. I didn't take the network security major, actually did some stuff in AI. And that was, that was one of my major areas. Um, but then I'm now employed for the last nine years or so in the space of network security. Um, and I know some of the others here, we've got electrical engineers, we've got mechatronic engineer, um, we've got, we've got all sorts of background that have all sort of converged here. Um, so yeah, there's no one direct path. Sure, so, uh, definitely agree uh, on that, Dale. So uh, if you look at myself on my background is I'm an electrical engineer and I haven't uh, worked on cyber security in particular, but in the last five years, I had the opportunity to start uh, working on cybersecurity products. So as Dale mentioned, it, it is not required that you have a background in cybersecurity to start participating because it's such a vast field. And once you get into the industry, you will be able to start with small steps and uh, build your expertise over time. Uh, th there's an, one more question on the chat. Any tips for people who are new and interested in this field? Does anybody want to take that question? I can take it. Uh, yeah, I think try to stay updated with the latest things, what's happening with cybersecurity. Just keep looking for any interesting webinars or conferences that are uh, free, for example. So there are a number of digital conferences that might be freely accessible and you have YouTube or LinkedIn search for cybersecurity. You might find some great content and like cybersecurity is very vast, right? You could pick a field that uh, within cybersecurity, you could feel, uh, you could look for any of those areas. Like you could focus on identity and access management, try to understand how does, how does it work in general? Like how do we, how does, Google verify that I am who I claim to be. And you could also look at the threat intelligence side of things where look at different kinds of attacks and different kinds of malware and just at a basic level, try to understand what each different type of attack is. So yeah, be curious. Yeah, sure, certainly. and. Uh... You know, as students, you might want to look at who are the local, um, locally available um, establishments who you know, who are specialized in cybersecurity. You may want to actively reach out to them for internship options, and uh, there are certainly internship op options available with companies like IBM as well. And companies prefer those who might have had internship experience in the past. So it'll be a good experience to connect with them while you're in the university, do a, do a sort of short-term course over there with them. And when you pass out, you'll, you'll already be having some amount of industry experience and it'll make you a candidate, uh, a top candidate for hire. Yeah, I think they'll just uh, send a message yeah. in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, so I just shared a link. So Jose Bravo, he's got a great amount of video content on YouTube there, um, all free, uh, all about Curator uh, and, you know, various security things. Um, and, you know, his channel goes back 10 years, something like that. So there's a lot of good content on there. And in particular, there's a series about setting up your home uh, network and monitoring it there. So if you wanted to do anything like that and play around, um, then, yeah, that's certainly a good way to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, if you don't have any questions left, I think uh, just a fine, uh, just to wrap everything up, right? You know, just uh, make sure you fill out a feedback form to see you know, how we can improve our events. 
I think just final shout out, you know, thanks to Sunil, thanks to Ariana, Dale, um, Holy, and Desmond for spending your time with us uh, on the lunch hour. And yeah, um, hope you guys enjoy the session and we'll see you in the next event. Awesome talking to you guys. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a Thank nice you. day. Bye bye. Bye everyone.